This is Keys to the Shock, episode 327, Relationships and Resiliency, with Xavier Alexander of Metric Coffee. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show, and I would love to have you subscribe to Keys to the Shop. If you haven't yet subscribed to the show, um, I would encourage you to just hit the subscribe button, and you'll always be updated with new episodes as they come out every month. Um, there's quite a few episodes. I think it's like nine or ten episodes per month on average. And so you want to be updated with all that great content, hit subscribe, and uh, welcome, by the way, to the show. I'm really glad to have you along. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Keys to the Shop offers consulting and coaching for you and your coffee shop. If you're just getting started in the business of coffee and you need someone to help you along the way, or if you're an existing operator and you want to refine what you're doing, you want to scale your business, you want to improve in some areas or all areas, you know, there's a lot of ways that Keys to the Shop can come alongside you to help you do just that. And uh, if you want to inquire about what consulting might look like for your situation, all you have to do is email me chris at keys to the shop.com and we can set up a free discovery call and talk about how i might be able to help you in your coffee business again that email for keys to the shop consulting chris at keys to the shop.com today's episode of keys to the shop is brought to you by the ground control cyclops brewer from voga coffee the ground control brewer is something that once you've experienced it, I think you'll never forget it. Not only is it amazing in terms of its looks, it's a watch it make coffee, but inside the machine, you've got SCA award-winning technology that is really opening up the possibilities of what you can extract from your coffee. It's basically like getting to know your coffee all over again. The control you have with this machine to extract an incredible range of flavors from your coffee makes it a game changer for your batch brew. And also the ground control Cyclops Brewer makes batched iced lattes, batched cold brew. So it brings a lot of efficiency and versatility to your bar as well. Go check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee to learn more. If you're wanting to up your game and offer your customers the best quality coffee and also bring in versatility and efficiency, then I definitely think you should check out the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. Go ahead and visit them over at groundcontrol.coffee. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series. Their family of plant-based performance beverages is designed with the barista in mind. Literally, they are uh, tested by the world's best baristas before they are even in your hands and in your customer's cup. And that means a great experience. It stands up to the heat from steaming, produces amazing texture for latte art, and also keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee which equals a really great plant-based beverage experience. And this is why Pacific has loved the world over because of all of the care and intentionality that goes into their products. So if you want to learn more and get these in your shop, check them out over at pacificfoodservice.com. Try it and see what I mean. And if you're looking for the best and to serve your customers the best plant-based beverages, you have to be using the Barista Series from Pacific. All right, everybody. Well, today's episode is such a great conversation, really focused heavily on relationships and resiliency in the journey of uh, coffee entrepreneurship, um, coffee roasting, just working in the coffee industry and trying to make a difference. It's a fantastic and deep conversation with someone who's doing amazing work. Um, we're talking with Xavier Alexander, who is the co-founder, owner of metric coffee in chicago illinois since starting metric coffee with his business partner darko they have been all about making good on their philosophy of quality coffee and people over profit their goal is to establish partners pay high premiums and publish transparency reports to offer real full spectrum equity with what they're doing in their business and this philosophy is something that is continually uh, at the forefront of what they do. And it's not been an easy road along the way. I mean, there's challenges, of course, in starting a business and personal and professional. And we're going to get to hear a lot of that today. Xavier's coffee history, um, challenges in his own personal and professional life that have led to how he operates today and how he operates this business along with the team there at Metric Coffee. 
This is something that they are constantly working on. And as you'll hear in this conversation and also observe with the work that they do, they are making good on it one relationship at a time, and it's making a big impact. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode as we talk about relationships, resiliency, sustainability, transparency, and much more with someone who is certainly walking the talk, Xavier Alexander of Metric Coffee. Well, Xavier, welcome to Keys to the Shop. Really excited to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, absolute honor. And I've heard uh, incredible things about you consistently oh, and uh, what you're doing over there at Metric Coffee. And so kudos to you. Um, your reputation you. precedes you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So flat. Uh, yeah, I just, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm blushing right now. So <laughs> <laughs> we can thank hear you. it. We can hear it on the microphone. You can hear that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. There's so much that's gone into uh, not just building Metric, but just kind of building who you are. And of course, yeah. a business is kind of the distillation of the values and the, the personality of the people who kind of uh, founded it and run it. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, there's there's a lot that we're going to talk about, I think. But the, pla- the place I like to start is sort of how you developed your values along your career, uh, you know, the philosophies that you have on coffee and how you operate now as a professional. How did those things kind of take root in the early parts of your career, even uh, before metric? For me, it, it's I, I believe it, it all started with, uh, you know, so I was born here in Chicago, Illinois. And then um, my mom, like we're, we're, uh, we're Puerto Rican. So when I was around two years old, we moved back to uh, Puerto Rico and I was there until I was maybe six or seven. So, and, you know, coffee, within the Puerto Rican culture is really, you know, it's, it's, I mean, I think in many cultures, it's a thing, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, I grew up drinking coffee, you know, so it's just always like coffee, milk and crackers. And uh, um, I just grew up having a, a love and a taste for coffee. So um, because, because of that, and as I've, as I've gotten older and have, have grown to really appreciate and look at coffee differently, um, it's, it's something that I've just, I'm extremely passionate about. And for me, what, what really changed it all from the point where I, you know, like in the beginning, I guess when I started my career in coffee, um, I used to roast coffee back in like early two thousands and I was roasting really dark and syrupy, you know, adding syrups and really just thinking like, Oh, this is really special. This is really unique. And then once I started learning more about the, I guess the uniqueness of really wonderful, really well-processed coffee and well-roasted coffee. um, It just, it changed everything. It really just, it, it, it showed me the possibilities of coffee beyond that. Like my first origin trip, which is back in uh, 2015 is really when everything changed for me. And I think that um, speaking to producers and connecting with them and, and really coming full circle, in my passion and journey for coffee is what really developed, I guess, like where I stand today with metric, which is to be an ally for coffee producers, to tell their stories, to do the best job I I possibly can to ensure that the way that we do business is not only fair, but it's also transparent and, 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 and for people to enjoy it. So that's, that's, I guess that's sort of in short, uh, where I stand with things today and where, and where I started. So. Yeah. That, so that human yeah. connection with that origin trip, especially, I mean, but you had been roasting and in, in coffee for quite a bit before that and yeah. kind of seeing it from uh, a greater distance than when you got to the origin and, and had that experience. And mm-hmm. how, how did those moments kind of um, develop your, view of the industry was it a was it a, a moment where were there moments let me ask that yeah just like um there's more to this than what i'm doing and i need yeah. to find out absolutely i mean it, it's it was definitely transformative um visiting uh small coffee producers and this was in honduras back in 2015 and uh, we had just launched Metric two years prior. Um, before that, I was uh, also, I mean, I had been roasting for another company for a couple of years prior. So I had been in 
specialty coffee, working as a roasting manager and uh, really enjoying that part of the, of the trade. But uh, when I had launched Metric with my business partner, Darko, and then we you know, eventually two years later ended up making connections in Honduras, for me, it was just transformative. It's like meeting these people in, in their land, in their homes, and speaking their language, connecting, um, just connecting with them on a human level, it, it, it really just made me fall in love even that much more. Like I just, I never thought I could love it more, but then, uh, yeah, that experience really just brought my passion for coffee to a whole new level. And, and also as much as it inspired me and as much as it really just sort of made, made my heart full, you know, like made, made me realize like I am in the right place. I am doing my, my calling. It also made me realize how heartbreaking it can be because I would say that a lot of producers we work with even today are the most humble and kind people. And they're just so genuine and so passionate about their, their trade, their, their craft rather. I can see how far we've come with quality and also with the prices we pay, but I can also see how much further we need to go. And so back even in 2015, thinking like, oh, I'm paying a price of, you know, two, whatever, 275 farm gate. That's amazing. That's a wonderful because the market is so low. So, you know, of course, like kudos to me. And then you actually talk to them and you cover cost of production and you cover um, all of the things that are really just uh they're not sexy, you know, they're not like the sexy marketing material. They're just like, here's the real, real. And you're like, oh, wow, we have a lot of work to do as roasters to meet producers where they need to be mad at. So that, that for me was a sort of my, my starting point in understanding our position in the value chain and how we can add value to the lives of coffee producers. Your position as an owner gives you the ability to make a difference, whereas your position prior, maybe you were limited by different operational philosophies or um, opportunities and in, in different things that you just kind of maybe would tie your hands if you if you wanted to make a difference in one area you just had responsibilities in another that didn't that didn't allow you to do that and so yeah with with this business there's a lot of responsibility that happens uh as a result of having that that kind of power and like you say representing the the um, story and the coffee to the consumer through your business um and, and that's a lot to take on. And it, it wasn't an yeah. easy road for you to start that with your partner, Darko. You know, what led to starting the, the business itself rather than just continuing to work in coffee? Was it a desire to just kind of do your own thing, make a difference? Yes. Um, what was that? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I, I'm going to give you the the sort of the real reason, I guess, like I, I have like a, a reason I tell most people and, and, and that is a, a real reason, but uh, truthfully, I didn't launch metric with Darko as a way to fulfill like a personal desire to own my own business. Um, I was, um, I had really great opportunities that I guess uh, came later in my career, my last job. I guess I had a position as a roaster quality control uh, person for, for the company. And then later on I got promoted and I, I felt like all the opportunities that I wanted in the beginning weren't really there until the very end. But by then I had already made a decision that I wanted to launch Metric. Um, and really the, the real reason was I had a, I had a review that came up uh, in one year where um, I was thinking that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to at least get a dollar raise, you know, like something good's going to come out of it because I've been, I've been delivering, right? I've been, I've been delivering. I, I know I'm doing quality work. Um, I'm, a, I'm a team player. I'm doing what the company needs me to do. And I was really proud of the work I was putting out. And then in that review, um, it, it didn't turn out so well. And I'm not going to go into details as to why it didn't turn out so well, but it really, it really bummed me out. It, it kind of actually broke my heart because I was expecting, I wasn't really expecting like they're going to give me, you know, like I'm not, I'm not thinking I'm entitled to all this money and more, you know, like a pat on the back. Hey, thank you for your service. But really it just broke me down. So when I left, I took that paper from the review and I, I saved it. 
I saved it and I looked at it and I kept looking at it like, you know what, I can, I, I know that I can do better. And so that was, I guess, my first sort of, a, not, not an aha moment, but it was more like, okay, I need to do something and, it's, and it can't be this. So when I had met Darko, um, he, he's just one of those people that is, I don't know, like he, he's, uh, he's a mover and a shaker. He's a guy that if you, need, uh, if you need something to get done, he's gonna get it done. And when I had met him, I was really attracted to that. And he owned a cafe at the time. And so I would visit often and I would, I loved the way that he performed espresso service and filter and, you know, just how, how he treated customers and how he, he interacted and engaged with them was really a, attractive from, I guess, from a customer standpoint. And so we went out for beers one night, we talked about life and, you know, just a million other things. And it's like, Hey, how cool would it be if we launched a roasting company together? And that's, that was the, that, you know, thinking about that paper and that meeting I had and the review and then he, and how excited he was, it was just like, okay, totally let's, let's do it. And that, that was the, I guess that that's how it all came about. So. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. It, it, it kind of was yeah. serendipitous that you had this, yeah. um, you know, uh, relationship, this friendship with somebody who is just kind of down for the same thing. And you had this review also, which you turned into motivation. In, instead yes. of making it a demotivator, you you said, I can do better, not like, hey, I can do better based on what they said, but I can do better than what I'm doing right now, like where I am in the industry. I can create something better for myself. Uh, and yes. I imagine just for other people too. Um, so what, yes. when you when you founded Metric, when you started this process, um, you know, what did the first year look like in terms of, you know, establishing what would be the foundation of the company and what kind of thought went into that, that was born from that desire to do something different and better? So the first year, I would say even the first three years was, uh, it was one of the hardest periods of not just my life, but also my wife who um, has stuck by my side and I don't know how, but she did. And I'm grateful for that. Um, and, you know, it's just, it felt like we were launching something really special that we thought people would care for, but it, it turned out to be more like, why are you doing this? Do, does the city need another coffee roaster? Does the region need another co coffee roaster? And of course I, I, you know, that's a valid point. Like, the, like, why are we doing this? And I knew for my own personal reasons, my goal was to establish like a foundation with my business partner, Darko, in, in a business that can not only work with quality coffee and be, you know, source and roast quality coffee, but just have a culture that where, where all the, all the experiences that I learned from my previous posts that I could hopefully be I could be a catalyst for change. Having a different environment where a lot of things that I previously saw, we no longer have to do or, or be a part of. Like we can change things in a way that makes, I don't know. Like, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm struggling with even talking about this because even eight years into it, like we, to be fully transparent, we still haven't figured it out. Like we, we keep changing our missions. We think we're about this. And sometimes we're about that. Like we, we know who we are and we know we love coffee and we know that we love people and, and enjoy what we do. But, you know, it, it's, uh, I guess what we've become comfortable with is understanding that we can't always be the same. Like we, we always have to evolve and change with the times and change with the dynamics that are before us. So, uh, but going back, yeah, the first year was really difficult. I mean, we had like two accounts. Uh, we couldn't get anybody to pick us up. I, I had to work other jobs. My wife was working in other job, you know, like we barely, I mean, we got by on $300 a week uh, in the beginning and just lived on link cards and you know just the food food stamps and uh you know no family help no no support it just it was really hard i don't wish it on anyone but i can honestly say today that had it, had it not been for that experience 
I think I would have, I would be taking our current success for granted, you know, and right now um, we're really blessed. We're really thankful for the growth and for the opportunities that our wholesale partners and our online customers, subscribers, et cetera, have given us because with, without them, we wouldn't be us. And, um, and without those, that, hard road of uh, rejection, that hard road of, uh, you know, of feeling doubtful, feeling like we are not worthwhile. Um, we wouldn't have the perspective we both Darko and I shared today, which is to be humble, to just be real, you know, like, let's not kid ourselves. Like we're no better than anyone else, but we really are proud of our achievements today. And none of that could be accomplished without the people that stuck by us, like our spouses and, you know, like our customers. So that's, uh, that's really special to me today. I love the lessons of resiliency that mm -hmm. obviously have shaped the way that you view things and has, I, I, I don't doubt in, in no small part, helped in some way to empathize with the families that are struggling in producing countries. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, and you've experienced a, a, some struggle. Everyone experiences some struggles, some more than others. And taking, just like you took the review mm -hmm. and used it as a motivator, looking at those struggles in the early years as a motivator for humility and empathy and it's kind of like servant leadership is really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, had it, had it not been for those experiences, I think, yeah, our, our, our mission and our vision for today and also the future would look vastly different, but I, I gotta say like, however difficult our, our past experiences were, I am really grateful for that. I mean, I, I, I couldn't, you know, if you were to ask me that question five years ago or seven years ago, when bills were due and the lights were going to get turned off and we barely had money for milk, I would probably give you a different answer. But I, I also, when you, when you said resiliency, I, I, I know the word and I always remember like, oh yeah, I see that we, you know, I guess I, I am a resilient human. Uh, not just by my own might, it's just, I, I was inspired by other people at origin, which is why the supply chain working with producers is really important to me because I see how resilient they are in their adversity and that inspires me. So that going back to 2015 and that visit and meeting producers and, and when they visit you and invite you into their home and they cook the very mess, the, you know, the very best food that they have available because they're so uh, honored to have you. That to me was just one of the most humbling experiences. And I am blessed to have that experience every single trip, every single time I visit them, it feels like coming home. It feels like visiting family. And um, I, I, I don't come from a personally, I grew up extremely poor and I don't have a large family. Um, so that to me has been, it's kind of filled a part of my, like a hole in my life. And so that's why the work I do is really personal to me and it's really important. And um, yeah, I, I am very grateful today for the, for those, uh, I would say, I, I don't wanna call them terrible experiences, but more so like those really challenging experiences. And that that is, I guess, like without putting it out there in the world, like for, that's my personal mission. That's like what I strive to do is to be able to, be in a position where I have the power to pay it forward by paying a better price to the producers and also really addressing them in, in, in a way that feels like they can feel dignified. They feel like the humanity in the process, not just uh, like a, you know, and I'm, I'm going off the subject here and I apologize because I, I, I am a, a father of three children. So I, I kind of like gravitate, like my conversations <laughs> change from, you know, I'll be talking about pizza and then I'll be talking about a, a diaper and then, you know, talking about coffee. So I'm my, I'm all over the place, but what we're talking about here is what I am most passionate about and I am most proud of. And um, my hope is that as I learn more and more uh, how to be a better human and be a better steward of my position is that I can inspire my children to, to not, not follow in my footsteps, but more so like be inspired by like, Hey, dad got to do this. Like, um, and I, I want to support them in whatever 
mission and, and sort of endeavor they, they go into. But I would love my proudest moment would be for my children to to also have a serving heart, if you want to call it that, you know, like, mm-hmm. be just be able to have uh, be inspired by others and be able to serve. There's so much to to talk about there for sure. So we could be talking mm-hmm. about this for for quite a while. And I, I think people listening, um, as we're guided by values, we're guided by you know a thought of you know I want to make a difference. And there's there's I I hope for a lot of us some kind of a uh, a noble cause that's at the heart of you know the actions that we're taking. And I and I view a lot of what you're saying as sort of like the, the refinement process, the purification process, if you will. Like yeah it's it's harsh it's hot it's it's uh destructive in some way but um your dedication to seeing it through to the point where you are today it definitely means that there's no quitting i mean it doesn't seem like there's like the idea that well you know just we're gonna uh dip out real quick <laughs> yeah yep <laughs> You've yeah got more on the line than just a business absolutely i love that you said no quitting because that you know there were many many times it's, it's not that I was never at the verge of quitting, but there were some times where, you know, when family, like when I feel like I'm hurting my family by the decisions I've made just to launch a business with literally no money and no support, um, it, it was very painful. But for me, knowing that I, I grew up, I mean, I, I think like many of us, you know, like I, you go through certain periods where you're extremely depressed and you feel like, you blame everyone else but yourself. I went through that. You know, I'm 44 years old today, but you know, going into my early 30s, I, I just had a I had a small chip on my shoulder. I felt like, oh, I'm, you know, the reason why I'm not getting opportunities is because of this. Uh, because like I always blamed everyone else but myself. And so when I stopped feeling sorry for myself and feeling like I was not worthwhile or worthy of of any. I guess anything better, then it, it became more like, then I need to get down to the root, sort of the root of it all and understand and recognize and call it out for what it is. And, and, and then, you know, being honest with myself, I had to just say like, okay, cool. I recognize that this is how I am, but I want to change and what can I do? So, so, you know, it, it, it it was, I would say that for me, it was a, about a 10 year period of refinement and telling myself that I cannot quit. Like I'm, I can't quit no matter what. So if I was sick, I, you know, I'd still go to work. If I hurt myself, doesn't matter. I still go to work, <laughs> if I, whatever it is. And I, I don't recommend this for everyone. You know, like, I mean, I think that's a, you know, something that I mean, clearly, like you, you got to know your own limitations, but I just needed to push myself because growing up, I didn't have anybody to push me in, in the right way. And so, you know, I, I, I guess I'm sharing all this and it feels like I'm getting naked and in, in sort of in a, in a big room. And I feel like I'm being, I don't know, like it's not the most comfortable conversation for me to have, but I think it's important for me to share because if one person is inspired by our conversation, and realizes like, hey, maybe I'm similar to this dude, and maybe I need to recognize these things, and I can change them, you know. Like, and but clearly, I I, I didn't change them alone, you know. Like that was I, that's one thing I want to address that I'm not one of these people like, and I did it all by myself, and thank you very much. Like, no, I had help, and maybe it wasn't the help that I thought I needed, but that's the beauty of it. In hindsight, the help that came along was the help I needed. I just didn't know I needed it. And that's, uh, yeah, I guess I've never said any of this, <laughs> but it's kind of cool that you asked me that. Thank you. The idea yeah. that um, there is this, uh, there are these opportunities for contextualization all around us to help, help us through the thing that we're isolated uh, in, where we feel, uh, I think there's a tendency, especially um when you're doing work like what you set out to do, I mean, for goodness sakes, you were a roaster. That was already an isolating uh, mm-hmm. position in the back of house. But then you get farther into it, and it's it's like you're all alone. But then you realize, you know, if you expand your view, you're not. There's this group of you know, people around you that I think are are willing to support you and offer context and help mm-hmm. help people through those dark times. Um, and then I, I like what you were talking about with the um, 
you're kind of like the problem is out there. Uh, the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl talking about how there the determination of how we process what's happening to you is, you know, it's a very, I'm not going to quote it directly, but yeah. it's basically between what you're, you're thinking or, you know, and your action, there's a gap, you know. Yeah. So if you take what comes your way and you simply react and don't process it, then you kind of are on this cycle that could be a destructive cycle. But, you know, just taking yes. a little bit of time to reinterpret and, you know, put back out there something that's that's not just reactive but is actually creative seems like it, it, it does make all the difference. I agree. Yeah. No, totally. And so now what, what you did uh, to start the business and, and, and all that you went through with, you know, the personal um, striving, um, mm -hmm. there's taking action in terms of operations. The decisions mm -hmm. that you make uh, you have access to coffee. You have the ability to make decisions on what coffees to buy, how often yes. to buy them, and, and setting up the practicalities that actually fulfill the the vision. So what kind of, um, I mean, just starting with like sourcing and thinking about what coffees to bring in, how to roast them, how to represent them, what went on there operationally? So I would say that, you know, like I, I'll kind of start from the very beginning and kind of work a little quicker to, to, to present day. But uh, when I had first gone to Honduras, I, I, I can tell you that back then I had only purchased, I think our, our first purchase was like four bags of coffee. So it wasn't a lot in the, in, you know, and at the time um, I was buying from uh, Olam, buying spot coffees and uh, my friend, Brandon Thiessen, who uh, uh, is just a, a, still a friend today and a, a wonderful human being. Uh, was really helpful in the beginning because I didn't have access to those relationships in the very beginning. But um, so, yeah, that four bags eventually t today turns into, you know, almost two containers a year, which is, uh, for me, it's mind blowing, right? Because I'm thinking four bags in the beginning. I'm like, wow, we are like buying a lot of coffee here. And now it's just a different, you know, it's just a different beast. Um, but one thing I learned in my first visit buying directly uh, for metric was that when I met Benjamin Paz, who is a dear friend of mine today, was that he's, he'd always told me, it's like, you should buy from people you like. And uh, I really like that because the simplicity of that statement was, uh, it's just, it's totally makes sense. So, you know, for metric, it became more so like, I would meet people, you know, like, and then it's like, oh, I, I, I like them. They're, they're, they're genuine. They're humble. They're not like, you know, they're not too salesy, you know, like I, we get a lot of too salesy people, you know, like they come in with the sort of the, the pistol around the hip and they're like, Hey, you want to buy this, buy that. And, you know, and the, I get that, that they have to do that, but I really have connected over the years. I would say that all the relationships we have are just people that I met on my on the journey. Like uh, uh, as an example, I met uh, Jose Rivera from Origin Coffee Lab, who um, is uh, from Peru, and I had met him here in Chicago because his wife is from you know she, her family lives here, and um, yeah, I had met him and he walked over to our our roastery and you know I showed him. Our place. I had no idea he was really selling coffee at the time. He was just like a really nice guy from Peru. And um, today we're buying um, quite a bit of coffee from Peru directly uh, with uh, in partnership with Origin Coffee Lab. And that that just manifested itself organically. I didn't have to force it. It was not like I had to seek him out and and or he had to seek me out. It's just that we connected on a different level. And I really appreciate that. And I would say that, yeah, about every offer, everything we're carrying at this present moment from all the origins are just kind of situations like that, where we had met, we connected, we really, I love the way they're, they do business. Um, transparency is up to, is super important to us. So having export partners that are able to not only put me in touch with the producers we're working with, but also um, give us reports and, and, and you know, uh, uh, you know, transparency reports from their end in order for us to piece the whole, you know, all the prices together is really important. And so 
you know, and, and, and I would say that another important thing is that um, I, the, basically all the partners we're working with, like at no point have they ever dissuade me from connecting with producers. You know, I think that's, I, I won't say that's a, like a, a thing everywhere, but I have heard that some exporters are probably not that comfortable with roasters talking to producers, et cetera. And um, we're really, I'm just really honored to work with literally everyone we're working with because they're so open to ha us having a direct relationship with these producers and that organically manifested itself and it was not an agenda that I started on day one. It just, it just was. And I love that that's how it turned out. Just the idea that you are collecting relationships along the way as your company grows and, and mm -hmm. uh, again, it, it changes in terms of how it's expressing itself over the years. And as yeah. you gain these relationships, I imagine that it has to change, right? In yeah. order to accommodate that. And that's that's really good, especially in these times. A lot of people who are looking to fill out their coffee menu, they will, you know, it, to, to say that these organic relationships just kind of come around seems very impractical. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in, and, and so is it, how, how do you balance the idea of, okay, like I met this person, they're really cool. I love what they're about, but then do you just like make their coffee work or is it a combination of the fact that they also have a coffee that you really want and know your customers will appreciate? Or are you able to, as a roaster, just say, no, you know what, uh, because they do a good job, um, no matter where the coffee is from we're going yeah. to make it work because of the relationship. Yeah. Oh, that's a stellar question. Um, you know, I, I will say that like when, when I approach, I guess, any relationship, any, any origin, the, I, there has to be a, mu a mutual trust between us and our export partners. And, and, you know, I would say that by and large, they all have, uh, you know, they all export. They are, you know, clearly that's their main business, but they also can be connected to a mill uh, like Honduras, for example, working with Benjamin Paz, who's I think is a good example of, you know, of our first relationship and how uh, we work with other producers is that we, we have a mutual respect for one another and he understands what we're looking for in terms of quality uh, in the beginning, because we weren't looking to buy like, uh, you know, any, any regional blends from Santa Barbara, uh, we're, we're looking just for small producers only doing maybe one to two to three bags of coffee, um, at this particular cup score, this, the, these particular tasting notes and profiles. Um, he, he's just so connected with, I would say hundreds upon hundreds of small producers in the area that he will know that so-and-so in this whatever, like in this uh, part of the, of El Cedral is producing stellar coffee, but does not currently have a committed buyer. So that that's how those connections were created. And then over time, with a fair price to the producer, we don't put this on them. We never hang this over them. But you know, we, we what we can hope for them is that they uh, not only turn a profit, but also utilize some of their their income to reinvest back into the land to maybe grow a little bit, you know, to more to um, add to their infrastructure to in order to not only increase the volume, but also improve qual quality. And that that is something that we like I enjoy seeing and being a part of, but it never really, it's never really that cut and dry. You know, you could do all the things right. You could pay a producer a, a really good price, a farm gate. You can do, you know, you can advance uh, money to them. You can, you know, buy them equipment, et cetera, which are our things we've done. And, you know, it doesn't always equal a quality product. So going back to you, to kind of what you were asking, like, what do we do then? Like, do we, you know, invest all this money and time and resources and what happens when it doesn't pan out? For me personally, what I've learned is that it's really, 
you know, when you're that invested into their business, you're really that connected to what's going on at the ground level or farm level. Um, it's really crappy to, to ask them to do all these things for you and, and kind of like, okay, here's all the guidelines and protocols we need you to follow in order for us to be a committed buyer. And then suddenly they do it all or half of it. And then the product is not up to your standard. I, yeah, I, I'm not okay with just saying like, well, I'm gonna go ahead and abandon you on this harvest because I don't like it. So what do we do? We buy it, you know? And so as we've grown, we, you know, we used to focus on just buying three to five bag micro, micro lots. Now we're, you know, we're buying full containers of coffee. And so we may pay the premium price for that lot that didn't turn out and just bulk, you know, put it into a blend. Um, and that, so that's how we mitigate some of these things to reduce the risk on the producer end is to, that to me is being invested in, in, uh, being invested, um, on the, on the farm level, you know, like being invested with the producer and working with them. Touching yeah. on something that I think is, is it's a little bit of a, a leap, not a leap, I would say just like one foot in front of the other, having faith in the relationship that even though what's produced may not meet the highest uh ideal it's yeah it, for i mean i i think i would assume it's it's not bad you know what i mean like yeah there's there's certain elements of you know uh minutia that we have as an industry today more than ever that disallow us from being faithful in our relationships for reasons that might not be great reasons because we didn't sense quite enough pineapple or grapefruit yeah, yep. in that. And then you you flush this entire um, opportunity for somebody else because we've built up this idea that in our marketing, in our customers, like, well, we have to have a successful business. And if we don't deliver something that's completely uncompromising, in our ideals, then we're going to lose our business and we're going to go out of business, which seems uh, yeah, a little yeah. bit of a scarecrow. Yes. So you have now this uh, retail shop that you've been running that represents these coffees to the customer. So it's not even just like now the roastery, it's running a coffee bar where a staff of people are responsible for uh, expressing the coffee uh, and then also talking about it with customers. How does that relationship work or how does that transference of values and information work when you have to delegate the task to baristas so that that story is well represented and the coffee and the cup is actually well represented too yeah oh excellent question um you know i think part of the benefit of having a, a really really tiny cafe inside our, our, our roastery so you could there's glass you know we have a glass partition that you could see right into uh, our roasting room and um and then we have a lab connected to our small cafes that we have an in-house educator who you know with all new hires and just and even just like uh, you know hires that we've had for a couple of years it's just to constantly be in the know and, and staying sharp in order to um ensure that they're they're equipped with all the knowledge with you know what what's in this blend what are we selling for this particular release you know or rather what are the tasting notes for this release who's the producer and how can we best be able to translate that to consumer to our customer so um one thing i, I really love and it, it's you know with the pandemic it's kind of weird because pr prior to the pandemic a barista would leave the counter if a customer is just facing the retail shelf and then it's like hey how you doing and, and you know just have a more i would say like a more white glove service if you will like having a mm -hmm. uh, a barista there to express like well i'm really digging this coffee because of xyz or what do you like to drink at home how do you like your coffee and i would say that because of that, like that's kind of historically how we operate the, sort of the hospitality um, end of customer service for the cafes to really be personal. It, it, it's what's uh, it's what helped us develop a loyal local following. You know, like we have a lot of customers, like repeat customers coming in every week, buying retail coffee. You know, they could go to other places and buy our coffee, but they come here to the source. And and it really is by and large due number one to the people and 
also there and, and because of the people, meaning the baristas and their dedication to brewing the best possible coffee really at the source, you know, it's, it's part of the romance. And that's what keeps people coming back, keeps them engaged. And, um, you know, we, we can't pay them enough to care. They have to bring that passion and care to the table. And then on, on our end, what we have to do is just give them the tools It just present the tools that, okay, this is everything we have available. And if we have, if we, if there's something we're lacking in terms of equipment, in terms of, uh, literature, in terms of, uh, you need more time to work with a certain milk or, you know, or really like experiment with resting espresso longer or shorter, whatever it is. Like we, we love it. Like we, we welcome that. Uh, by and large, is what's you know made our really really small cafe, I would say, very successful in our market. So, so strong communication yeah. between yourself yeah. and uh, yeah. what's going on in the front of house and and what they know that they need in order to do a good job with the mm-hmm. coffees that you're providing them with. That's really great. So you're you're trusting that they, that they understand. You know, they're brewing your coffee all the time. You know, yes. baristas are tasting the espresso. Uh, probably more than you. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. They, they're the experts in this, uh, along with the customers too. Really, if you want to, you know, think about it. Um, yeah. So having that good communication between the roastery and um, and the cafe is so critical. No, uh, very. And we we only have one cafe. Like people have asked us, you know, it, we're we're an eight year old company and. You know, we have uh, other friends in Chicago that are roasters that are probably around our same, you know, same eight to 10 years in business. And, you know, they might have three or four cafes. We only have one. And we, we, one thing we, we always tell people is like, this is not a race for us. We're not trying to beat anybody. This is not a, a, a race to, to, to opening seven cafes and being sort of having a, a footprint all, all over north and south of chicago it's really just more so like we we run things at a pace that feels right to us and we because we are a small independently owned coffee company if we're going to expand which it is a part of our it's always been a part of our plan is that it must be viable it must it must make sense it can't just be like oh this opportunity kind of makes sense but you know i don't know let's do it anyways like no we we don't approach it that way we it took a lot of work to open one 400 square foot cafe on our own. And we know that establishing a second or even third cafe is just going to require a lot of work. It's, it requires us to make sure that we understand what our mission is moving forward, which we do, but also like we need, we need a workforce that is in line with that mission. And we are very, very lucky today to have a, a stellar group of people, even throughout the pandemic, they stayed on, on staff to work with us. And uh, we're, we're forever grateful for their, um, for them sticking around. We're really eager to look at, you know, what's next. And hopefully that would be another cafe. But um, yeah, we just got to p- feel really comfortable with like, how we're growing and where and why we're doing it with our motives. So it sounds like you're just open to having it look the way it needs to look in order for, to, in order to make good on what your intentions are, your mission is. It doesn't, doesn't yes. have to look a certain way. There's no like real black and white. Um, and if it takes longer or looks different, it's fine as long as you can do what it is that you know is is driving this whole thing, which leads me to ask, like, basically, mm-hmm. what does success look like to you? Like, no matter how it looks, how do you know that you're successful? Ah, oh, I love that question. Um, I, I think about that three years ago, my wife and I, um, we bought our, our first, we, I have never owned really anything except a really, maybe like a crappy Ford Escort back in high school, or, you know, just like, I've never really been much for having anything and, and haven't really lived anywhere that's worth talking about. But, um, for, for the last several years, we had been saving up, you know, just eating ramen noodles and just, you know, <laughs> being, being very like frugal in, in our, in our spending. And then we pulled the trigger and bought our first home. So we have three small boys and it's a really old, tiny little house. But for me or for us, I would say that that was just like, you know, we, we felt like 
we've made it, you know, like we felt just because we have, we have a home, you know, like we have a family and we have a home and, and that, I don't know, that, that was for me, that was just like transformative. It felt like, I felt like I have succeeded and maybe I, and, I, and it's not about finances, you know, like we're not rich, we, we, we work in coffee. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing okay. But that was the point where I realized like, man, we've really, we've made it, you know, like, and of course, other challenges are obviously there's a plethora of challenges that are still, you know, before and after the house. But uh, when that happened, when that moment happened, when we got the keys and a, and a place to move into, it felt like we created a safe space. And were it not for metric and all of the opportunities and 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 really just like our customers supporting us from day one, that that you know, that wouldn't, that would have not been possible. And I'm, I'm mostly, and I'm, and one thing I'm really proud of is that we were able to do it on, on our own. And, um, you know, that was painful to save all like that sort of a, you know, the chunk of change to put down on a home, but that was, uh, yeah. I mean, growing up, moving from place to place and living in squalor and then having like a house, feels like wow holy cow we're <laughs> we're we're doing all right so anyways yeah i would say that that was that that was it and then i mean there's other little things i mean not little things but there's other things too like being able to when we when we were able to offer healthcare as a part of employment here at metric that was like man we are doing we're successful you know like that's success and of course you know like you know, when you look at our bank account, then it's like, oh, maybe it's not, we're not that successful. But nevertheless, it's like, that's okay. We're not, we're, we're, it's not a race and we don't have to answer to anybody. We're that, that's the benefit of having a small, truly independent business is that um, we are doing our best to make sure that we're stay afloat and we're viable, but also like investing in the areas that need investing in, which is our staff and paying more for coffee. And that's, mm. That's who metric is today. So that is wonderful to hear. I yeah. absolutely love that those examples. And when I think of that, it's like what you're describing is the capacity uh, to to give, to give opportunity for a thing. You have capacity to create these these moments for your own family and you know, for other families in, in yeah producing families yeah, is your business has probably produced many uh, similar moments for people along the way just b- by uh, dint of consistency and dedication um, and being a successful business, you know, having a solid foundation along, you know, you have to be a successful business and viable business, like you say, mm-hmm. in order to make that difference. Um, and, and make good on those kinds of values that you have. So that's awesome to hear. And I, yeah. you know, when people hear this and as we wrap up here, I wanted to ask yeah. sort of the idea of how we order our steps as people who in this audience, I think by and large are in some kind of position of influence or maybe in the future soon may be. Mm-hmm. Where should we be focusing, especially as as roasters and you know, sole retailers? Where should we be? Where should we be focusing our energies, if you had your way, in the next oh, five to ten years? Yeah, I love that. Um, as, as coffee professionals, we were. I would say that anyone who's involved in this industry, you're. If you're here, that means you you obviously love coffee and you're extremely passionate about our trade, um, but. The real, real sort of the, the real nature of things is that we there there's a crisis that is occurring, and I'm not trying to sensationalize things, but but it is real. And um, what I in, in the crisis is the price crisis to coffee producers. Like on our end, roasters and even retailers, we're we are doing okay. We're we're struggling in way in different ways, uh, but they're, they're it, it's nowhere near in the same way that coffee producers are struggling and their their trade and their performance and everything is um it's really yeah they're they're struggling and i think we can do better 
the challenge is that we don't always know how we can do better. Even when we think when we're paying a quote unquote a better FOB price, like we I would I would encourage that we all educate ourselves in um, connecting with not only with our export partners but also with producers in, in knowing how to ask the right questions and how we can better serve uh, their business because that's what it is. They're all small businesses. And uh, when I was and I just sort of uh, want to address this, I was in Colombia in July, and that was uh, maybe about a week or two before the Brazilian frost. And so uh, me visiting producers in Nariño and then having them all tell me that their the, the their cost of production and labor and everything had had a fifty percent increase overnight, um, which was really challenging because they need they needed cash to operate on that very day like they need cash to pay produce to pay pickers they need cash to pay for uh pesticides and herbicides to keep their uh their plants healthy and they just don't have the money and that and that is really difficult to hear because i'm thinking like oh we're ready to pay whatever this price and then sure enough when you think like that price is sustainable, quote unquote, sustainable and fair, it turns out that it's really not, you know, so that's where we have to really make sure that we are staying educated and also changing, like pivoting when we need to pivot. So, um, so I would say that maybe, you know, just more education on that front uh, for all the roasters and cafes that are buying coffees from roasters that really are passionate about that. And then the other sort of to summarize, um, Consumer education is key. If we find ways that can connect these stories and also the challenges within specialty coffee to consumers in a way that not only adds value, but also like they connect, they're like, oh, I, I, I see what I'm supporting this, not just this roaster, but the producer. That level of transparency, however it looks like to you, like as long as it's authentic and it comes from a real place, it's going to hopefully result in a good outcome, which is to turn people from not just buying coffee just as a vehicle for caffeination, but buying coffee because of, you know, the quality, the flavor, and also the sustainability angle. You know, it's something that I, I'm thinking about every day. And uh, in fact, there was a project that we released a couple of months ago. It's called Source Code. It's a magazine that um, sort of lightly covers the supply chain, but also talks about, um, it, it, I, I add a, what's called a value chain analysis, which takes the price from the raw material down to the retail price. And so why I did that is that I wanted our customers to see exactly each and every cost involved in producing one single 12 ounce bag of coffee and to also include our own cost of production, which you know, includes the packaging, the label, the roasting labor, you know, like everything involved on top of like um, the insurance we pay, the rent, the lights, the gas. It's a, uh, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money to run a business to, to, and to do it right. But if we don't start there and start the conversation and include consumers, I, I really feel like, yeah, it's, it's just going to get harder and harder to compete with a lot of the noise out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah, and and yeah, I, yeah. I, um, the source code is yeah. really cool. I read that. Um, and it is you know, equal parts, you know, like transparency report slash educational resource and the idea of bringing consumers along um, and, and really um, allowing them to see what's behind it. it uh, I also think is, is really critical um, yes. And just like your relationships that you are dedicated to with farmers, you know, the, the relationship yeah. you have with consumers um, will probably have a compound effect over time it, rather than just trying to have like quick marketing um, mm -hmm. about things uh, like transparency or uh, the price crisis and things like that. Um, having a dedicated uh, effort put into that relationship just as much over time mm -hmm. will probably produce the kind of things that that we want to have produced in that how they will see coffee a little bit more holistically and that will add to you know finding solutions for these these things yeah totally yeah 
Um, this has really been fun. Um, I appreciate Thank your you. heart so much in in what you do, in your view towards towards business and relationships. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, where Metric goes in the next eight years, um, especially knowing the kind of, of values and mission behind it thus far. So thanks so much, Xavier. Uh, how can we stay in touch with you, um, get a hold of source code and buy some coffee and, and visit you there in Chicago? Um, so our location's at 2021 West Fulton. Uh, we're in West Town, sort of a part of Chicago. Um, and our website's www w.metriccoffee.com and we're at metric coffee on instagram and twitter um we uh have our you know full line of uh merchandise and, and of course coffee and uh the the magazine's also for sale in on our website and uh yeah that's uh you know i i i'm i'm you know, if, if anyone wants to uh, email me, of course, and they have any questions, uh, um, it's xavier at metriccoffee.com. Every, every now and again, I get an email, random email from somebody asking an, an amazing question. And I love it. So if anybody has any questions or just wants to get connected and for whatever reason, please feel free to do so. We'd love to hear from you. Wonderful. Thank you, Xavier, yeah. again. Thank you so much. Well, everybody, I hope that you enjoyed that episode. There's a lot to take away from uh, Xavier's experiences. One, of course, the idea that we can use challenges and setbacks as opportunities for growth and refinement that doesn't have to make us give up on our mission, our, our vision for what we want to accomplish and, and, and make an impact on in the business of coffee. And two, the idea that they've just built this is not being a race. They want to make sure that they are a viable business, that they're having a positive impact on all the people that are involved, both in Chicago and that they represent across, you know, different areas of the coffee growing world. Um, but they're doing this relationally, one step at a time. And that is really refreshing um, to hear somebody who, you know, could put the gas on really hard and and multiply and uh, you know build in in such a way that maybe we're used to seeing instead say this is not a race if it makes sense for our business and especially if it makes sense for the relationships that they've cultivated and are responsible for today and yeah that might mean slower growth than what is technically possible but it's evident that rather than thinking about what they can do they're thinking about what they should do and what will yield the best long-term impact rather than something that just uh, rises up quickly and then goes away. Like I said, I'm excited about the next eight years for Metric Coffee and what's in store, especially with that kind of a foundational philosophy behind it. And a huge thank you to Xavier Alexander for joining us on the show. I would highly recommend you check out metriccoffee.com. Buy their coffee, buy source code, the educational resource and transparency report that they've published. They also have a podcast called Source Code, and you should subscribe to that as well. And of course, if you're in Chicago, go get coffee from them at their cafe. So if you have any questions or comments or feedback about today's episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, definitely email me, chris at keystotheshop.com. I'd love to hear from you. And also uh, reach out to me if you're interested in Keys to the Shop Consulting chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, pretty soon, yeah, I mean, really soon in March, there is something called Coffee Fest. If you're familiar, uh, Coffee Fest is now 30 years old. For three decades, Coffee Fest trade shows have been operating multiple times a year, providing what I think is the number one event to go to to help you thrive as a coffee service professional. That means if you're working in a coffee shop, you want to learn about people management, you want to learn about POS, you want to learn about um, just making coffee and the products that are out there that you can serve in your store. There's so much to learn at Coffee Fest through the uh, seminars, the trainings, the workshops, uh, all either free or accessibly priced. Plus there's the trade show floor with all of the great vendors. There's the competitions like Latte Art and Cold Brew. And of course, the community 
of like-minded people getting together is is always uh, incomparably great. So if you're looking to energize your staff and resource yourself with great information for your coffee shop, then definitely check out coffeefest.com. You can get 50% off when you use the code KEYS, K-E-Y-S, uh, that's for all the shows coming up this year, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Seattle, you can get 50% off your registration fee by using the code KEYS when you register over at coffeefest.com. I'm there for most all of these shows, teaching, judging, and uh, definitely say hello to me. Again, find out more information at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today. Thanks everybody for taking the time to join us in this conversation with Xavier over at Metric Coffee. I really hope that it was inspirational to you. And of course, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.